On this video, we're going to talk about attachment theory and attachment styles. Also, very specifically, some of the challenges of relating to a person, a loved one who is a bit more avoidantly attached, and also begin to answer the question, what is differentiation? Stay tuned. Welcome to the new love addiction. I'm Alan Robarge, a relationship coach and a psychotherapist. We have a lot to discuss on this video and I'm going to break it down into three categories or three areas of organization uh, to help structure how we're going to move through some of the content. We're going to talk about attachment theory and attachment styles and then uh, very specifically how to relate to a partner, a loved one, a family member who is a bit more avoidantly attached. And then also we're going to begin to explore what is differentiation and how, uh, when we take the, the theory of def differentiation, how does that compare to attachment theory? Attachment theory came from John Bowlby. Uh, it has to do with looking at our system of attachment beyond a psychological understanding, but in fact that it is ingrained in our being, in our brain, in our nervous systems, that we have this system uh, that helps us survive, that over evolution uh, as a species, we have needed to develop a whole set of skills of bonding and connection and the ability to exchange warmth in order to function and to be productive and ultimately to survive. We needed to be in close proximity and connection with loved ones or a very special loved one that would help us orient, that would help us survey the area around us, that would help us take in information to identify, hey, this other person has my back. Hey, this other person is looking out for me and I am doing the same for this person. And when that is interrupted, we can experience some distress. The attachment system will, will, will uh, set off the alarm of a distress uh, and we realize like, oh no, I need to connect with the person that I'm with. So the attachment system uh, over time, there are a series of an experiments done uh, really looking at the relationship between uh, a parent, a primary caregiver, a mom and a child. It doesn't always have to be mom, uh, but in general, it's about the mom, uh, the, the mother child relationship. And out of it came a series of identifiable ways that the parent and the child were bonding. Now, I'm not only going to mention that in the early research with regards to the parent-child relationship, that over the years, at some point, I seem to recall, think that it was about, you know, in the 1980s, perhaps the early 80s, that they're really uh, caught uh, uh, steam or, or caught momentum around applying the ideas of attachment theory to adults and how do we create as an adult, how do we create our relationships, how do we bond. So from that research and then even fast forwarding uh, from that point of its uh, hypothesis to present time, there was a whole series of uh, advances in uh, science and the ability to, in the advances around uh, uh, the neurobiology, neurophysiology of brain functioning and what is actually going on in the brain. And there have been a number of studies and advances in the science around uh, the neurophysiology of relating and attachment that has really greatly enhanced not only our understanding of relationships, but has, has really greatly fortified and um, um, strengthened the uh, theory of attachment and how we actually are hardwired uh, to connect to other people and to be in relationship. So out of this research, there came some uh, categories of how people are in relationship and that their styles of relating are identifiable. 
very generically, we can call, we can begin to think about this as people who are securely attached and who and those who are insecurely attached. Now, a securely attached person is able to maintain their own sense of self, their own t- autonomy, and at the same time, value being in relationship with another person. Uh, there is an ability to accept influence. There's an ability to feel, uh, to give and receive with a sense of equality, uh, to give and receive affection, to give and receive uh, comfort, to give and receive attention. And that there is a exchange where both parties feel um, actually enlivened or comforted uh, and that there is a strengthening of trust in the bond, in the attachment bond. So that is secure attachment. However, there are people who um, do not ultimately are able at all times to be in this level of engagement of a give and take of equality and to accept influence from another person in fact their nervous system uh, triggers some alarms of either feeling a sense of desperation and despair around a person not fully being available to them or just the opposite they will feel a sense of engulfment or enmeshment or being overwhelmed through the intimacy overwhelmed uh, through the level of connection that they will want to retreat and want to back away So as I said, we generically have these two categories. We call them secure attachment and insecure attachment. Underneath the insecure attachment are essentially three and some subcategories, but three categories that describe uh, what the presentation of someone who has a bit more of a uh, insecure attachment style. And again, to repeat, what that means is a person will experience a certain type of distress in the actual connecting, in the bonding, uh, in the uh, exchange of emotional connection. And these symptoms are what describes the insecure attachment style, and also they are coping mechanisms. The insecure attachment styles are a presentation of uh, symptoms and ways in which a person is trying to cope with some distress or some overwhelm to their nervous system when they are in relationship, when they are in intimate, close relationship. So under insecure attachment style, we have what's called preoccupied anxious attachment, and it's very self-explanatory. A person who is preoccupied and anxious in their relating to another person means they're going to have uh, hypervigilant thinking. They are going to be preoccupied with what is the other person doing. They're going to highly monitor the frequency and the quality of relating between each partner and try to map and understand, are we close now? Are we connected? oh, look, now we're distant, now we're a little separate. There's a hypervigilance, a hyper-awareness, and a ability to be uh, overly concerned about what is going on in this relationship. What is the state of, what is the state of the affairs? And this comes with higher levels of distress. This comes with anxiety, thus the name preoccupied anxious attachment. Now, the next attachment style is what is referred to as being avoidantly attached. And again, it's rather self-explanatory based upon the word avoidance. A person who is in a relationship, in an intimate relationship, and if they gravitate a bit more to a particular style, an attachment style of being avoidantly attached, then they're going to want to retreat. They're going to experience their level of distress in a relationship when a person is making advances, when a person is offering vulnerability, when a a person is offering a bit more of a deeper emotional connection. This is gonna trigger some sense of alarm around being engulfed and being flooded and losing their sense of self. When this happens, the person is going to respond. Again, it's a kind of coping mechanism. It's a response to manage the distress of that discomfort. 
And so the response is to retreat and pull away. This could be literal. This could be a person taking space. Hey, I need to get out of here for a little bit. I'll see you later. Or no, let's cancel plans. I think, why don't we just hook up next weekend because I'm a little busy today. Or it could be a little bit, a bit more covert or it could be a bit more emotional that the person is physically there in proximity, but they're emotionally distant, emotionally shut down. Now, under the category of avoidantly attached, uh, an, an avoidantly attached, uh, 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 an attachment style of avoidance, there are also two presentations or two kind of sub presentations that get mentioned here. One is called fearful, uh, fearful avoidance, and the other one is called dismissive avoidant. Um, I keep changing the word saying avoidance versus avoidant. Um, I'm using them interchangeably as the same thing. So we have a fearful avoidant presentation and we have a dismissive avoidant presentation. And that just speaks to a bit more of the origin of the experience of what's going on for the person uh, who identifies a bit more as avoidantly attached. Now, another attachment style and uh, some of these, some of the literature, when they transitioned from looking at children with parents and then looking at adults, some of the act the, these labels, um, there's different writings that sort of obscure the words, and obscure is not the right words. Um, they um, they don't always match up completely. And I think my understanding, I have yet to have this totally uh, explained to me why. I think that what happened is th the studies with children and a parent evolved to not use the exact same language. And then also over time, I've noticed there's a number of researchers and theorists who write about attachment theory and they reduce it down. They really summarize instead of looking at these, uh, these uh, uh, different presentations or these subcategories, they simplify it and make it um, a little more accessible by simply saying secure, preoccupied, anxious, or avoidant. Now, I'm going to offer a couple more based upon this other research, and um, it depends on if you are referencing a bit more of a simplistic approach or if you really want to get into some of the, the nitty gritty of this. So, preoccupied anxious attachment, avoidant attachment. Two subcategories of avoidantly attached uh, person would present as either fear-based avoidant or dismissive avoidant. Now, another category that often comes up or could be a quality that is applied to both of these categories or a bit more for the preoccupied anxious is the phrase ambivalently attached. If someone is ambivalent, if I have ambivalence, it's captured in the phrase, a part of me wants to do this and another part of me wants to do this. I both simultaneously think X as well as Y. And I am unclear if I want to move left or if I want to move right. I'm able to hold uh, two uh, oftentimes opposing uh, choices in my mind. And this creates a presentation of ambivalence because I'm not actually able to make a choice and to be committed to what exactly do I want? What exactly am I choosing here? And so a very easy way to represent uh, an ambivalently, uh, ambivalently attached person is it has a come here, go away quality. It's a push pull way of relating. Now, sometimes this ambiv, as I've already said, that there's like crossover here. Sometimes an ambivalent, ambivalently attached person uh, who's a bit more preoccupied, anxious, the preoccupied, anxious person will be trying to manage their distress and manage their anxiety. And one way that they do this is they're, they're trying to talk themselves into, give themselves a pep talk and say, I, yes, you know, yes, come closer. Yes, I do need to connect with you. Yes, I'm willing to take the risk to, to be in relationship with you. And then when they actually get the closeness, there's even more distress. They're even more preoccupied with what's going 
going on. Uh, there's a kind of flooding and a confusion around, okay, now that we're actually this close and that we're connected, I'm fearing, I have, I'm fearful that there's going to be a separation. This person is going to leave me. This person is going to distance. Um, and that could either be just, you know, for an afternoon, like why didn't this person call? We call every day, we text every day. Now all of a sudden they're not calling. Or it could be a deeper rooted fear, such as a fear of abandonment, that the relationship is rocky, that there's not a sense of security and this person might actually leave. So when that happens, we find that one way to manage the um, distress is to send mixed messages. And yes, come here, no, no, stay there. I'm a little, you know, I want to be close to you, but now I'm cautious and scared. It's a kind of joining of both the preoccupied anxious and the avoidant style. So that's called ambivalently attached. There's also what is referred to as a disorganized attachment. And oftentimes a disorganized attachment is, again, just the way the definition of the word is shared, is that it has a, a rather a confusing presentation. And oftentimes, um, or ultimately, the, the origin of a, of a disorganized attachment style is really someone who came from um, uh, what we would consider a bit more severe abuse, a very confusing house, household, very confusing home life, very confusing, unreliable parents who were not emotionally there, or when they were there, there was uh, a, a, a very noticeable inconsistency in their availability to the point that it made the child's brain, uh, the, 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 even the adult child as we grow up, that uh, there's a rather confusion around trusting and understanding, relating, and, uh, and being able to read cues, or even relating itself, the act of intimacy, the experience of intimacy, is in and, in and of itself a trauma trigger. And so disorganized attachment um, very oftentimes is, is really beginning to move into look at a relationship trauma and attachment trauma. And when a person is presenting with a disorganized attachment style, um, their trauma is yet to be integrated. So those are the different styles. That's what we're talking about. Uh, secure, preoccupied, anxious, avoidant. And sometimes for avoidance, we have fearful avoidant or dismissive avoidant. And then also we have the ambivalently attached style, as I said, could sort of apply to either of those. And then finally the disorganized uh, style. Now I wanna share an idea that so much of this is based upon uh, research and hard science and the neurobiology, neurophysiology of what's going on in the brain and how the brain works when we're relating. So in that sense, it's unrefutable. In that sense, it is just a fact. In that sense, it's saying, well, there's something going on. We have, we have enough science to understand that this is a system and a function of our physiology and our biology and uh, who we are as a species or as an organism. How we are attaching and connecting with other people um, is ingrained and hardwired into our survival and comes from a result of evolution. So we know that there's a kind of just a foundational acceptance that this is a product of the brain or this is a part of brain functioning. Now, the reason why I make this distinction is because there is also an application of this information that we would consider to be a bit more psychologically based of saying, now that we know this, now that we have this science, can I use this information as a way of orienting to my psychology, a way of orienting to how we need to be in relationship? And when I apply that as a kind of theoretical orientation, as a kind of foundation that informs my psychology, what this means is it reinforces a strong belief or reinforces telling the story of human relating as, as 
a kind of need that must happen and that the symptoms, the struggle, the distress, the uh, relationships that uh, don't work out and how we get caught and stuck looping and trying to make something work, that from the perspective of attachment theory, we're really, we're, we're, we're trying to base our um, interpretation of this kind of uh, distress and struggle on this underlying need to be with another person. That it is a given to say, you know, from an attachment theory perspective, it's a, it, we, we have one of the givens is, well, in order for more healthier functioning as a human being, in order more, for more healthier emotional experience in this world, I need to be in emotionally attuned, uh, emotionally um, reliable relationships that offer me trust and safety. I make this distinction. I'm trying to look at both the neurobiology, but then also use, using this as a kind of theoretical orientation of how it informs our psychology, because I want to introduce another idea, which is referred to as differentiation. And differentiation comes from Murray Bowen. Uh, he is a family therapist or a pioneer in family therapy. And, uh, evolving uh, so many years out of differentiation. There's a uh, wonderful uh, author and therapist and researcher uh, known as David Schnarch, which I always like saying his name, Schnarch, um, S-C-H-N-A-R-C-H. And he has a book called Passionate Marriage. And his point of view uh, about understanding, relating, is really coming through this paradigm and a, a theoretical orientation about differentiation. So I want us to, to, to hold both and understand both, and let me explain what differentiation is. Differentiation is this idea that as human beings, we have a drive and a need to be in relationship, and we need that kind of softening of our ego boundaries, the, the, the kind of merging of becoming one, the, not in a total sense, but this softening of ego, uh, ego boundaries so that we can really connect with another person. And there is a great sense of exhaling and um, um, really belonging when this happens and that we have a need for emotional connection. So, so far what I've said sounds very, very similar to attachment theory. However, in differentiation, it's focusing on a tension between two experiences. And the second experience is our need for uh, independence and autonomy and uh, self-reliance and to take care of our own business. So, Differentiation is the realization that these two opposing forces at times are opposing and that the a healthy integration of a differentiated person is able to maneuver and balance and hold both the uh, need to get close and connect while simultaneously also retaining your own sense of self, your own autonomy. You are differentiated. Now, there is an image that comes to mind that's really helpful here. There is an existentialist philosopher named Schopenhauer, uh, who I am not very familiar with. And also there is a book called uh, Schopenhauer's Porcupines, which is the image that I'm borrowing from. And quite honestly, I read that book years ago and I don't even really remember what it's about. But the image is really lovely because Think of porcupines with their quills. Think of porcupines are prickly. Think of porcupines as also living in packs and living with their family or you know other porcupines. And it can get cold when you are out in the wild, especially when it's winter. So let's imagine the porcupines, they come together, they need to be, they need the warmth of proximity, they need the warmth of community, they need the warmth of connecting to each other uh, for survival and uh, to live together. 
However, they're porcupines and they have quills, so they poke each other. And this, of course, is unpleasant. And so they distance, they scatter, they move away. And now you have uh, the porcupines over time, they become a bit too cold. They become a bit too isolated. They do realize they need the other porcupines. So they're going to move back together and they will get so close and inevitably prick each other and then they will scatter and they will create some distance. And this process is going on back and forth and back and forth. The kind of getting very close uh, pricking each other and then realizing, okay, I need to separate. While this is, uh, as Schopenhauer writes about it, a kind of existential dilemma for human relationship, it's also the beginning of a good image to think about differentiation. Differentiation would not be that I'm a puppet to the system. I think the existential exploration of it is more that this is a kind of uh, a riddle. As far as as a human being, how do we solve this as a riddle? Differentiation is a bit of an answer or a response or a solution to that riddle. It's saying, well, we need a skill, a kind of third skill, a third focus. And that third focus is how do we manage to live uh, holding the tension between our two drives of closeness and separation and closeness and separation. And that when I in fact can consciously choose to come together and to create some closeness, I'm not going to lose my sense of self or lose my autonomy or lose my, in, my sense of individuality. Even when I allow those moments for my ego structure, uh, my ego boundaries to soften, and I can really let in the influence of another person. I can really allow my mind to release into the comfort and the safety of a kind of emotionally attuned exchange. So to repeat or to create some summary here, we do have this kind of orientation of attachment theory being this drive of be with someone, be with someone, be with someone. And a kind of uh, an, another alternative that's very helpful to work with here is this understanding of differentiation is that we do need to still maintain and cultivate our ability, not only to be independent and autonomous, but to maintain our independence and autonomous simultaneously while we are also practicing uh, or welcoming some emotional connection, emotional warmth, emotional attunement, um, which all are big clunky words that mean relationship. So can we hold the tension of both? The need, again, the image of the porcupine. I do need to come together for warmth. I do need other people to connect with. And at the same time, I also need to know how to create the distance and the separation so that I can stay grounded in my own sense of self, my own preferences, my own likes and dislikes. Um, and I am not overly come uh, or engulfed or enmeshed in this permanent state of lack of ego boundaries or lack of sense of self. When this happens, this is what we're referring to as codependency. Codependency as this loss of a self. Now, lastly, on this video, I want to mention a couple ideas and thoughts about relating or being in relationship to a partner or a loved one or a family member who identifies as a bit more avoidantly attached, an avoidantly attached style of relating. And what I said earlier, there is a fear-based avoidance and there is also a dismissive avoidance. The dismissive avoidance, um, all of this understand is coming from a place of fear um, and coming from a place of distress. But if you're on the receiving end of someone who is dismissively avoidant, ouch, that hurts because it's going to feel like being shut out. It's going to be feel like being pushed away. Now, here's the thing, and I can't speak, I'm, I'm not making, uh, I'm going to make some generalizations about uh, those who might present as a bit more avoidantly attached. And I do so 
humbly and with some care because we don't want to pigeonhole people and we don't want to label people as this way or that way and that there's in fact a whole range of presentation and people do not just show up one way all the time. They actually, it's based upon the degree or level of distress in that moment of relating and what's going on around them that will activate their coping mechanism of a uh, attachment style where they would need to distance or in the preoccupied anxious attachment person would need to be more clingy and more, you know, uh, please don't go, please don't go. So I'm going to be making some uh, uh, um, uh, categor categorizations, a kind of uh, judgments about uh, avoidant attachment. And please know that it's not definitive and it doesn't apply to everybody all the time. However, I do want to point to one specific area or one specific dynamic that comes up here is that many people who are a bit more avoidantly attached would not consider themselves avoidantly attached and would not consider that a kind of category of an insecure attachment style because from their point of view, their emotional needs are getting met oftentimes, not always. But usually there's not a kind of awareness that something is lacking because they are coming from the place of controlling or offering what they are willing to offer at any given one time or one moment. And if the other person is not available, or let me rephrase that, if the other person is available, then they're taking on this information. They're in this exchange as their needs are getting met. So if you are more of a preoccupied, anxious attachment style, and you would want to communicate and begin to have an engaged conversation with a partner, a family member, or a loved one and say, hey, guess what? I, I notice that when oftentimes we get so close, there's a kind of shutting down, a distancing, a pushing away, or just generally being unavailable. And I would like to draw our attention to that and maybe you know give you a heads up that in fact, I feel shut out when this happens. Usually, no matter how skilled you are, no matter how compassionate you are, no matter how neutral you are in being able to present this as a kind of idea where you're requesting a, a bit more of a conscious relating, chances are a person who identifies being a bit more avoidantly attached is not going to get it in the sense they're not really fully going to understand how is it possible that something's lacking. And it becomes a conversation as if both parties are speaking two different languages and the preoccupied anxious person is trying to really help the other person speak their language and trying to and 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 even coming up with some sense of frustration around well how could you not speak this language how could you not understand what connection means how do you not get that i keep asking and saying hey please can we connect on a little more intimate deeper level can we share uh, more presence. For a person who is orienting to resisting or avoiding those type of scenarios, they're not going to have the sensitivity to notice the frequency of the interactions. They're not going to have the sensitivity to realize the other person's experience and they're not going to want to give it up either because as I said earlier, this is a defense mechanism. Oftentimes what happens is that when you share this feedback and information is the avoidant attach, the, the person who has a bit more of an avoidant attachment style, when they really do, they're really trying, they really are listening. The challenge is they hear that they are inadequate. And some of this might be some family history. Some of this might be some, you know, coming from a family where there was some uh, shame involved and so that the, the person's shame is getting triggered. But even if it's not so much about the repeat of some unintegrated family history, when the 
person, the bit more of the either securely attached or the partner who's a bit more preoccupied, anxious, is trying to say, hey, honey, I notice that oftentimes there's a limit to how close and warm and uh, connected that we can be. And when this happens, you shut down or I notice a distancing occurs and then that triggers distress in me. Then I get even more anxious and then I get even more um, either needy or demanding of wanting you to connect with me. Honey, I'm wondering if we can work on this pattern. Oftentimes for a person who is avoidantly attached, they are not going to hear the nuance and the range or even the invitation to join in practicing doing something different. What they hear in that moment is, honey, you are inadequate. You are failing me. You are failing to show up in the right way. And for this reason, you are now less than a partner. There is something wrong in our relationship and you are the reason why something is wrong. No matter how skilled, loving, and uh, kind the, uh, the, uh, the person who is making this request and, and saying, honey, we need to change this quality of relating. There's going to be a, an initial, often, you know, hopefully we get beyond an initial stage, but there's gonna be this initial response around imploding into one's uh, sense of inadequacy. Now, you know, that, that that in fact is some of the history of how the avoidant attachment style gets uh, set up in one's life. Usually either it could be the avoidantly attached person or it could be the preoccupied anxious person uh, or the ambivalent person or the disorganized person. That usually where this comes from, where this is coming from is some history in a family where uh, there was a um, certain level of unavailability by a caregiver. And sometimes that could have been very covert and not very abusive, but just impactful in such a way that it made the child feel, hey, my parents really not here for me. They're here, but they're not here. Or the child noticed there's a kind of chronic ongoing absence. My family member, my parent is absent here. Uh, and it could be just emotional absence. And most of us as children, are, we're not terribly conscious of this. It usually takes time as an adult to be in a couple relationships, quite honestly, relationships that have failed, that we then hold up the mirror to ourselves and go, okay, something's going on here. So for someone getting the feedback who is avoidantly attached and they're getting the request to say, Hey, do you think you could show up a little more? Do you think we could practice a kind of uh, staying present to each other? Um, their whole defense mechanism around their family history of being in some way ignored, neglected, abused, betrayed, or even violated, if there was a kind of over enmeshment, uh, being engulfed by a parent, a parent who is too overbearing, then naturally that person's whole orientation to relationship is going to be, hey, I, I really need to protect myself here. And just the question alone uh, by a partner, either securely attached partner or a preoccupied anxious partner to say, hey, let's experiment with not uh, distancing so quickly. Let's experiment with actually moving into emotional, uh, deeper connecting. That is not inviting to a person who identifies as a bit more avoidantly attached. That actually is a trigger of distress. That actually does not sound fun. That does not sound uh, romantic. That does not sound like, you know, something that this person wants to do. So it can be, if you just heard my exhale, I mean, there's this moment in these uh, demands and these distancings of a kind of being stuck in a stalemate and realizing, wow, this is not workable. 
which is ultimately my last point I like to include on videos. I like to include, well, what the heck does this mean? This is a lot of theory, a lot of grand, you know, fancy information. Uh, but I always get the question, okay, great, how do I apply this information or what do I do with this information? I want to very simply today, um, in opposite of you know all the information up to this point has been a bit more complex, but in this moment offer a rather simple response to the question of, well, what do I do with this information or how do I apply it? How do I work with it? There needs to be a rather honest inventory with one's self and relationship. A very uh, real, straightforward uh, assessing. Am I with a partner or am I a partner that can accept the level of relating within a certain degree or certain range that has presented itself? Most people will say, how do I salvage this? How do I change this? They don't really mean how do I do healing work to you know, evolve into integrating a, a insecure attachment style. What they're really saying, the code underneath that is, well, how do I change my partner so I get my way and I get what I want? And how do we convince the partner that the partner has to change? Usually that is that whole ideology, that whole thinking, that whole type of question is going to keep you hooked and stuck in unsatisfying looping of two people who are unable to find the common ground of when they're connecting, they can tolerate a, a certain sense of proximity and warmth and connection and an emotional sharing. And at the same time, when they actually feel overwhelmed, again, like the porcupines, when they feel they have that porcupine moment where they need to separate, that they're only, they're only distancing within a range that is both tolerable and okay for themselves, but tolerable to the partner. And what many people fail to do, they fail to assess the situation and say that range is not tolerable. And it does not matter all of the healing work, all of the integration, all of the couples counseling, um, all of the, you know, the constant midnight conversations or conversations to one in the morning of two people trying to speak different languages and understand their different languages to bridge that connection. That if they're fundamentally not even in the ballpark and that they orient differently, even their nervous system, the level of, of dropping into emotional exchange, emotional attunement, emotional mirroring, the warmth of connection. It, so many people oftentimes define this so fundamentally different that it's not about how do we change one or other of the partners. It is about saying, we are mismatched. We are not even within the same frequency to make this workable. And one reason how we know that that is true is because you already naturally would have been able to work this out for some time. You would have already naturally been given feedback or observed through interactions. Um, well, I do have some distress here when he or she distanced, but I don't uh, get all bent out of shape about it. My level of activation of feeling preoccupied, of feeling anxious, is within a reasonable range. What happens when we're way out of that range and it's, it's, it's registering in our body as unreasonable? Oftentimes the focus is not about, well, how do we repair or salvage the relationship? It's, it's being able to accept we are just not a good fit. We are a mismatch. We don't even come together to cross over to overlap within the same range. This truth or this information I'm sharing is what so many people will not accept and what so many people fight against and what so many people will have a temper tantrum and argue and get bitter and contemptuous and resent each other because they're just constantly trying to say, why can't you, why can't we come into 
a certain range of uh, shared emotional exchange. We must accept because we're both different people. We're not meant to be together. We're not good in this relationship. It's time to end and I need to quit forcing some kind of distortion of reality. The information that I have gathered here, what I've observed for some people, they've been in a relationship for five years or 10 years or 15 years. It's not changing. It's time to accept you are not in the right match of someone who can mirror within the range of your need for a certain level of emotional connecting, emotional attunement, emotional mirroring, uh, emotional warmth. I hope that some of this or all of this was helpful. I acknowledge it's a lot of information. Um, I really want to help with the language and the terminology because so much of this can be confusing. So if some of it doesn't land, if some of it is confusing, I hope because of the, the nature of video, you can just watch the video again and still take a couple pieces of information that you can apply to your life that will be helpful. If you want to explore these ideas, if you want to talk to other people who like this kind of thing, uh, you can join a Facebook group. Uh, it is called The New Love Addiction, and I will include uh, the URL here so that you can uh, go and join that group if that interests you. Also, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. Uh, I'm making a series of videos, more videos to come. And if you like videos just like this, then by all means subscribe and you'll stay abreast of when I upload some new videos. And then finally, if you want to learn more about me, please do. You can find out about me at alanrobarge.com. And then lastly, again, thank you for watching. I will see you next time.